good afternoon and good evening to all the uh, <clears throat> friends uh, respected teachers all the speakers uh, chairperson and the panelists i invite you on behalf of uh, uh, acns for this our first uh, education webinar uh, for this year and uh, to start with this webinar we have uh, uh, professor takio goto as our guest speaker today and uh, dr asil ibrahim's bay as our vice speaker today and uh, dr professor yoko yoko kato our president of acns as our chief patron uh, professor uh, uh, chandrashekar dev pujari as our uh, uh, chief chairperson for today's session because uh, he is having a vast experience in the neuroendoscopy and the skull based surgery the topic which uh, our chief guest professor takio goto is going to speak about uh Chand Dr. Uh, professor chandrashekar dev pujari is a professor and head of the neurosurgery at bombay hospital he is also chairman of wfns endoscopy and neuroendocrine committee and founder president of neuroendoscopy society of india and uh, uh, along with that uh, we have two discussants uh, professor alexander vozniak who is the president of ukrainian society of <clears throat> neurosurgery and uh, uh, dr uh, uh, Serik Dusen B, who is uh, working as the chief neurosurgeon at Department of Neurosurgery at Kazakhstan National Scientific Medical Center. Along with me, uh, we have the co-moderator, Dr. Uh, Mohira Jaralova, who is from Uzbekistan, Dr. Ben Nengi, who is from Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Heba, who is from Egypt, and Dr. Mabel. Uh, she is from Ghana. She is the first lady neurosurgeon from Ghana. So. to start with i would request professor yoko kato to say few opening remarks and after that i would request our chairperson uh, professor chandrashekar dev pujari to say a uh, few things about this particular topic and then we'll start professor yoko kato you first okay. yeah. happy new year uh, to the 23 i'm so happy to see every face so very it looks happy and uh, today's webinar uh, i'm very much looking forward so and also the uh, Chandra Shekhar, the Japanese is one of my best friends, so she, uh, he can moderate other person Goto. So Goto is uh, now is not only Japan and also the worldwide, uh, very famous and also very skillful, uh, uh, and especially scholars the, the legion. I'm very much looking forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yoko Kato. Uh, uh, Dr. Chandra Shekhar Dev Pujari, can you please uh, say something? thanks uh, raja it's my pleasure to uh, chair this first session for the year uh, of the acns education webinar and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, professor tokyo goto who's actually taken over the chairmanship from me for the neuroendoscopy committee um, uh, from uh, uh, the last wfns meeting and uh, <clears throat> it has been a little difficult time for all of us uh, you know with the extended period of uh, the covid pandemic and though it is lifted up in many countries it still remains a problem and therefore these kind of activities are still very popular and <clears throat> the very fact that the younger generation uh, probably uh, is more tuned to these kind of formats and probably seems to not only like but uh, have certainly demonstrated that they learn uh, from this kind of a format has made all of us aware that we have to improve the contents of this and i think uh, that has been very effectively done by dr raja and his team over the past uh, couple of years uh, for these educational webinars as far as the topic for today is concerned i think the last two decades have seen development of a topic and it is most manifest in the fact that the predecessor of uh, professor takio goto uh, was dr kenji ohata who was a very very reputed and uh, you know well known uh, skull based surgeon and has achieved a lot of success in various kinds of skull based surgery in midline skull based tumors and the emphasis as you can see the transition from dr uh, ohata to dr goto has completely shifted 
to the another approach, which is uh, very effective for midline skull based pathologies. Dr. Goto is taking it further to other pathologies as well. But I think today for midline skull based pathology, it has probably become the first choice of approach uh, uh, to operate on them by endoscopic skull based approach. I am fortunate to join this movement at a stage that I can also carry on uh, with our own uh, <clears throat> development of this uh, project over the last 20 years and uh, have had opportunity to share that in some of our previous webinars. But today, uh, you can see how Dr. Goto has taken it forwards and I am sure you will find a wonderful wizardry in his uh, talk apart from the regular uh, indications. So over to you, Professor Goto, uh, for your uh, topic of the day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandrasekhar Dev Pujari. I would request Dr. Mabel uh, from Ghana to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Mabel, are you there? Yes, please. I am here. Um, good morning, good afternoon again. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to introduce our guest speaker. Um, he is a Professor Goto. He's a professor and chairman of the Department of uh, Neurosurgery in Osaka Metropolitan University. Um, he's also a co-chairman of the WFNS Neuroendoscopy Community. Um, today, he's taking us on an endos endoscopic skull-based approach to various skull-based tumors. Um, I'm really excited and looking forward to this lecture. And then um, the reason being that um, I'm an aspiring neuroendoscopist and I hope to really learn a lot from this. And I'm sure the YNS present here will also gain a lot from this lecture. Thank you, Professor, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so at was I would like to share my uh, slide. Okay, so uh, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, today, uh, I feel very honored to have the opportunity to present my uh, work in front of many young neurosurgeons. Uh, my topic is uh, endoscopic scar-based approach to various scar-based tumors. Uh, recently, uh, endoscope can offer a wide uh, panoramic view uh, in deep seed area, uh, which largely contribute to less invasive tumor removal, especially central skull based tumor. So today I will uh, present the two topics. One is uh, endoscopic endonasal approach, and oh, the other is endoscopic keyhole transcranial approaches to various skull based tumors. At first, I will explain the uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, I'm the skull based surgeon, so I rejected out most skull based tumor by the transcranial skull based approach. So I know most part of the tumor can be safely rejected by the transcranial skull based approach. But if the region located pure central skull base within this red circle, which connect in the old cranial nerves. Surgical resection by the transcranial approach seems to be very difficult. But if we observe the, this circle through the endoscopic and nasal route, the only obstacle to access this area is the bony structure, such as cryos, pterygoid process, and petrous bone. So if we master the surgical technique, or safe dolling of the bony structure, we can directly access within the circle with retraction, without any retraction of cranial nerve and vessels. So I will show our uh, several technique. Uh, uh, this patient referred to us 
uh, with a uh, visual disturbance, and MRI shows a retrochiasmatic craniopharyngeal. Posterior part of the tumor extends to posterior fossa. But if we observe and access this tumor by the endoscopic endonasal route, uh, we can directly access the origin of the tumors. And then, if we carefully drill out the bilateral posterior crinoid process, we can enlarge the surgical corridor and confirm the all uh, margin within the critical structure and the tumors. So I choose the endoscopic endonasal approach to this case. This is a surgical view. This is a pituitary gland. I carefully uh, elevate the uh, cera flora upward and expose the dorsum cera and posterior crinoid. I carefully uh, draw it out and remove the posterior crinoid. And this is a medial wall of cavernous sinus. I carefully mobilize the pituitary gland to the left side and then cut to the dura mater behind the dorsum cera. Now we are already reached the subdural space. This is a pituitary gland and this is a pituitary stalk. Through this approach, we can uh, clearly identify the border between tumor and critical structure. So I gently and carefully dissect the tumor using the three surgical instrument. It means that in this approach, uh, whole hand surgical procedure is very important for safe resection of the tumor. And finally, all tumor was successfully resected out like this. Postoperatively, all tumor was uh, successfully rejected out, and we can prevent. We could prevent the DI. This is another case of very large diaphragma cellar meningioma, compressing the uh, hypothalamus. Attachment of the tumor is the diaphragma. So. Uh, if we access the, this region by the endoscopic endonasal route, we can directly access the, uh, to diaphragm. At was uh, bone work was very important. I carefully drill out the tuberculum cera and open the oblique canal. And then this is a cera flora. And this is a pituitary gland. I mobilize the pituitary gland to the right side. And this is a diaphragma and attachment of the tumor. At the initial stage of the surgery, I completely detach the diaphragma. So uh, tumor was very uh, fibrous and hard, but uh, tumor already devascularized. So we can gently dissect the tumor from the critical structure. Uh, in this case also, three hands, uh, uh, whole hands, medicalous dissection was very important. This is the inferior surface of optic chiasma, and this is a hypothalamus and a PCA and a vaginal artery. After resection of the tumor, we meticulously seal the dural defect to prevent the CSF leakage. This extended approach, we have to carefully uh, seal the dural defect. We put the fat tissue to subdural layer and put some stitch to fix the fat tissue. And then cover the large mucosal flap to prevent the CSF leakage. Postoperatively, all tumor was successfully dissected out and uh, dural defect completely sealed. Patient visual disturbance improved and not caused the additional complication. How to operate this lower cryval meningeal? If we choose a transcondylar approach, we have some risk to damage the lower cranial nerve. And also, if use a combined transpetrosal approach, we have some risk to injure the abducens nerve. But if access through the endoscopic endonasal root, attachment is here. So it means that all cranial nerve is lateral side of this tumor. 
So I decided to remove the tumor by the transcribal approach. I will show our surgical technique. Now I carefully and meticulously drill out the cryval bone and also jugular tobacco, and then cut the drama. Tumor was already devascularized at that time, at this time, so tumor completely bloodless. This case, tumor was fibrous, hard, but uh, using the endoscopic endonasal approach we could successfully decompress the tumor from the brain stem. This is a vaginal artery and this is a eye. This is a tumor, ventral side of the uh, hypoglossal nerve. I carefully uh, decompress. And this is a tumor, ventral side of uh, vertebral artery. And this is a tumor, ventral side of the lower cranial nerves. Then, I reach to the lateral margin of the tumor. This is a, a, a <clears throat> abducens now. And uh, now we confirm that we reach the lateral margin of the tumor. This is a facial and eighth nerve. And we reject the tumor, ventral side of seven and eighth nerve. Postoperatively, also, uh, all tumor was successfully dissected out without any deterioration of the uh, lower cranial nerves. This is another case of the recurrent lower cranial meningioma. Transcranial resection seemed to be difficult, but uh, attachment is here. So if we access the transcranial approach, uh, we can directly detach and devascularize the attachment of the tumor. I uh, carefully and meticulously drill out the old bony structure around the lower clivus. Now I drill out the old lower clivus and then cut the dramatic. At that time, already tumor was devascularized and detached. So we can safely and carefully dissect the tumor from the critical nerve structures. Fortunately, this tumor was relatively soft, so we can uh, easily dissect it out piece by piece. This is a tumor around the pont medullary junction, and this is a tumor medial side of eye So I uh, resected out all tumors like this. Uh, uh, tumor was uh, successfully dissected out like this. And this is uh, another case of the uh, recurrent petrochrival meningioma. This case, uh, the uh, previous surgery and radiation obstacle the carotid artery like this. And then uh, MCA territory uh, was uh, supplied by the STA branch. So uh, if we plan the transcranial approach, we have some risk to damage the collateral flow from the STA. So uh, I choose the uh, uh, endoscopic endonasal approach to decompress the, this tumor. I will show our surgical video. Concept is the same. This is a paracrival carotid artery and performs a wide exposure of the uh, attachment. This is a, a seraflora and this is a carotid artery. Then I cut the dura mater, inferior wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, dura mater was completely removed out, and this is a left carotid artery. This is a left abducens nerve. I identify the left abducens nerve, and then uh, continue the removal around the petrochrival junction. Now I expose the left uh, optic uh, chiasma like this. 
and then also dissect the tumor from the uh, oculomotana. And then I reach the lateral surface of the pons. This is the tumor along the oculomotana. This case also, a uh, whole hands technique is very important for careful dissection of the tumor from the uh, oculomotana. Now, oculomotor now completely exposed from the brainstem to the cavernous sinus. And I also carefully dissect the tumor from the SCA. Then finally, most part of the tumor successfully des uh, resected out and decompressed without the craniotomy. This is the lateral surface of the pons. Abducens nerve, oculomotor nerve, uh, SCA, PCA was successfully exposed. This is the MRI postoperatively. Tumor was well uh, decompressed through the endoscopic endonasal route. Of course, some tumor left behind around the carotid artery, but most part of the tumor successfully dissected out. Then, I uh, will show the uh, endoscopic keyhole approaches. At first, I will show the anatomy of the endoscopic keyhole subfrontal approach. I usually put the skin incision around eyebrow and make the craniotomy with a size of three centimeter. And then I gently insert the endoscope along the frontal ways. Endoscope can offer the very clear uh, panoramic view around the paracera area. So using the endoscopic view, we can confirm the bilateral optic nerve and optic chiasma and the pituitary stalk, like this. So uh, we, I confirmed we can reject it out to the Tuberculum cellar meningioma using this approach. So I applied this approach to this uh, small uh, tuberculum cellar meningioma. This is a surgical view. At first, I gently insert the cotonoid uh, and gently retract the frontal base. This is the attachment of the uh, tumor. And this is a left of the nerve. Uh, at the initial stage of the surgery, I carefully drill out the tuberculum cera and also open the optic canal. So now left optic nerve was successfully decompressed. And also I open the uh, dura mater uh, uh, of the optic canal. And then I coagulate the attachment of the tumor. In this case, uh, we can uh, confirm the, uh, expose the contralateral optic nerve. This is a left optic nerve and this is a right optic nerve. So surgical the field is completely same, the transcranial subfrontal approach. But craniotomy is small and the tumor was safely dissected out like this. Uh, patient age was uh, 70 year old, very old, but the tumor was uh, successfully dissected out with less invasive keyhole approach. So uh, this was very effective procedure. This procedure also can be applied to the olfactory groove meningioma, like this. So uh, surgical uh, concept is the same. At first, I uh, put the craniotomy with the size of the uh, three centimeter. And then I uh, gently insert the endoscope to the frontal base. This is the attachment of the tumor. Using this approach, I carefully devascularize and detach the tumor at the initial stage of the surgery like this. QSA was very effective to effectively detach and devascularize the tumor. 
and then dissect the tumor from the frontal base. Uh, compare the microscopic view, endoscope can offer the very clear and panoramic view around the paracellar area. So uh, we can safely dissect it out the tumor like this. And I dissected out the final piece of the tumor. And this is the optic nerve. Optic nerve was also decompressed and the old tumor was successfully dissected out like this. So all tumor was uh, successfully dissected out uh, through the very small uh, craniotomy. Then I will uh, present the keyhole anterior transpetrosal approach or a keyhole subtemporal approach. Usually I put the skin incision around the frontal base, uh, temporal base, and put to the craniotomy with the size of three centimeters. And then I carefully uh, insert the endoscope to middle hosta. Uh, this is a catabolic study and we confirm that V1, V2, V3 nerve was completely exposed. And then also we can expose the Kawase's triangle. This is a GSPN and this is a V3 and this is a Petrus apex bone. After carefully drill out the Kawase's angle and open the Meckel cave, we can expose the old uh, course of the trigeminal nerve from the Meckel cave to brainstem. So this surgical corridor uh, field is uh, very similar of that of anterior transpetrosal approach. So. I applied this uh, procedure to Petrus apex small meningioma. This patient referred to us with uh, uncontrol uncontrollable trigeminal neuralgia after the gamma knife. So I applied uh, this uh, procedure to reject it out this small tumor. Uh, this is the right side. I uh, put the uh, craniotomy with the size of three centimeter around the temporal base, and then insert to the endoscope to middle fossa. This is a trigeminal nerve covered dramata, and I stimulate the GSPN using the facial simulator. And then uh, I uh, identify the GSPN and also cut to the dramata along the GSPN and expose the Kawase's triangle like this. This is a GSPN and this is a trigeminal nerve and this bone is uh, the bony structure around the Kawase's triangle. And then I perform the anterior petrosector. Uh, at this procedure also, uh, we need three instruments. So whole hands technique is very important. And then I coagulate and cut the SPS, most anterior side. So now the attachment of the tumor was completely detached and devascularized. So as, as tumor already devascularized. In the surgery of meningioma, devascularization and the detachment is a key step for safe resection of tumor. And then I cut the tentorium to confirm the horse nerve along the medial side of the tentorium. And then reject the tumor from the tentorium. Now uh, we dissected out the old tumor and removed out. In this case, tumor compressed uh, SCA and SCA compressed the trigeminal nerve. It's a cause, it was a cause of uh, her, his trigeminal neurology. And then I mobilized the SCA of the trigeminal nerve. Using this approach, we can safely mobilize the SCA. And this is a trigeminal nerve. And this is a brainstem. If we uh, insert the endoscope more deep side, we confirm the six nerve and also seven and eighth nerve. So 
tumor was the successfully rejected out through the small surgical corridor. This is a CT scan postoperatively. Uh, Kawase's dry angle was uh, limitedly drilled out through the endoscope, and the tumor around the posterior fossa successfully rejected out like this. So this procedure was very effective for safe rejection of such kind of the tumor. This is another case of the uh, trigeminal schwannoma causing the heart trigeminal neuralgia. This case, tumor distribute to the three area. One is around Meckel K, and second part is a posterior fossa. And also, anterior part of the tumor extended to the uh, infratemporal fossa. So we have to reject it out the tumor around three uh, different parts, but endoscope uh, was very effective to remove the tumor through the small craniotomy. I will show our surgical video. Skin incision is the same, and the craniotomy also three centimeter. So our procedure said, at first I uh, stimulate and identify the GSPN and expose the Kawase's triangle like this, and start the anterior petrosectomy under the endoscope. And then I opened the Meckel case. This case was a trigeminal schwannoma. So after exposed the tumor, just uh, we have to do is subcapsular dissection. So I uh, carefully uh, expose the tumor from the Meckel cave to brainstem. This is a tumor and this is a normal trigeminal fiber. So I dissect the tumor from the trigeminal nerve and carefully uh, continue the internal decompression of the tumor. And then uh, I move to the uh, infratemporal fossa. To look down the tumor around the infratemporal fossa, we have to use a, a 30 degree endoscope to get the look down view. And uh, I carefully continue the internal decompression. Endoscope can offer the clear view to identify the tumor and the new uh, trigeminal fiber. And all tumor was successfully rejected out and the brain stem was decompressed. This is the MRI. Uh, all part of the tumor was successfully rejected uh, through the small surgical corridor. This is another case of the uh, recurrent uh, condorosal coma associated with osteogenesis imperfect. Patient shows a vaginal invagination. So surgical angle around the tentorial edge was very steep. So it's very difficult to see the upper margin of the tumor through the microscopic view. So I use the endoscopic uh, subtemporal approach. Uh, you, under the endoscope, I identify the tentorial edge and uh, trochlear nerve like this. So I can carefully reject it out along the tentorial edge. This is a horse nerve, and this is a tumor, and this is a brain stem. Under the endoscope, I can carefully dissect it out. This is a trigeminal nerve. So uh, we, can, uh, we could reject it out, medial side of trigeminal nerve and also carefully dissect the tumor from the brain stem. So surgical angle was very steep, but we can safely dissect it out under the endoscopic view. So postoperatively, all tumor was successfully dissected out like this. Uh, this is uh, the last uh, example, how the endoscopic keyhole approach was effective. Uh, this is uh, the uh, falcotentorial meningioma. I rejected out this tumor through the endoscopic keyhole interhemispheric approach. Uh, if we insert the endoscope, we can get to the clear view. So 
uh, we could effectively detach the falx and also reject the tentorium at the initial stage of the surgery. I uh, place the patient to left side down lateral position and insert the ventric uh, ventricular drainage on the right side. This is a midline and this is a left side. I put the small craniotomy and then start the tumor removal. Craniotomy was very small and then insert the endoscope. Craniotomy was small, but we could get the relatively wide and clear surgical view. This is a Falcus and this is a tentorium. At the initial of the surgery, uh, we effectively coagulate the attachment of the tumor. So internal decompression was very, very uh, effective under the endoscope. I coagulate and cut the uh, previous falcus uh, and tentorium. After cut the tentorium, we can mobilize the tumor and can dissect the tumor from the brainstem and also deep uh, venous systems. After resection of the tumor, this is a, a, a galenic system and a deep uh, venous system. We preserve the, this venous system and achieve the total resection of the tumor like this. Postoperatively, uh, all tumor was successfully dissected out through the small surgical corridor under the endoscope. So endoscope uh, was very effective in this case. This is another case of the very large uh, falco uh, tentorial meningioma. But surgical concept and strategy is the same. I place the patient left side down park bench position and then insert the ventricular drainage on the uh, right side and the craniotomy was performed on the left side. And then insert the endoscope. This is a falx and this is a tentorium. At once I uh, coagulate and cut the falx and the tentorium. And then carefully perform the uh, detachment of the tumor. Uh, this is a, a falx and this is a tentorium. So, uh, we uh, effectively coagulated the uh, and the farms. and the tumor changed the blood rest. And uh, we could safely dissect it out from the critical structure, like this. This is a deep uh, venous system. Uh, this venous system safely preserved and the old tumor was rejected out. This is, is a post-operative MRI, being a system preserved and also tumor was completely rejected out. So today I will, uh, I presented the two topics. One is a endoscopic endonasal approach and the other is endoscopic keyhole transcranial approach. Both endoscopic procedure recently very effective procedure and it, can be very effective procedure for removing various skull waste tumors. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Professor Goto. It was really wonderful uh, journey through the base of skull, through various corridors. And uh, you first showed the first few cases where you have beautifully used uh, the endonasal endoscopic approach uh, and uh, added uh, your hemi pituitary transposition uh, kind of a maneuver to get to the clival lesions. And uh, later on, you have virtually taken a full 360 degree tour to various keyhole approaches through the skull base mm. uh, to remove lesions, uh, not only in the midline, but at various other places as well. And uh, the mastery over the endoscopic technique. I think the biggest advantage is uh, compared to the open skull based technique, uh, there is, uh, you, you do not require such an extensive approach with a lot of drilling. When you take some of these keyhole approaches, 
though i think through the endonasal technique uh the drilling has become much more uh, do, do you have any uh comment on this that uh, you probably endoscope helps you to remove more tumor uh, or remove tumor more easily through keyhole while when you go for an endonasal approach you need to probably remove much more bone to get to the tumor hmm. any uh, uh, comments on that uh thank you uh professor diopujari uh recently i used the uh, endoscope to various scarves tumor but indication of the surgical approach is very very important at first i started the endoscopic approach to central skull base tumor through the endoscopic endonasal approach uh, after familiar with the endoscopic technique and uh, surgical instrument uh, we could understand the uh, indication of the keyhole surgical approach step by step so in some small tumor keyhole approach was very effective but in case of the keyhole endoscopic approach if we prepare the large craniotomy we can also reject it out by the microscopic skull base approach so uh, which is a safe and uh, which is a less invasive it's very uh uh depend on the size and technique and the concept so it's very difficult which is a uh, good indication to keyhole but uh at first i recommend to familiar with the endoscopic approach through the endoscopic endonasal approach and then move to the endoscopic keyhole approach to some case this is my comment especially to young neurosurgeons I, i think one more thing which was very noticeable is the special kind of instruments which you have created for not only coagulation forceps but also scissors etc to mm. use with your endoscopic keyhole approaches i yeah. think that is something which is extremely important uh, yeah, to yeah. be available if you wish to do these kind yeah. of approaches uh, there was a technical question in the question box saying that do you use uh, lumbar csf drainage for the supraorbital or the keyhole approaches yes uh when we plan the uh, keyhole endoscopic approach i prepare the lumbar drainage to all case but uh a decision how drainage the csf should be decided based on the surgical finding in some case the frontal base approach no need to drainage the csf but prepare the lumbar drainage is very important if brain is a tight no space to evacuate during the csf in the keyhole approach so i always prepare the lumbar drainage this is a good comment uh the good question yes thank you i i would leave uh, the floor to our other moderator colleagues uh, to uh, make any comments or questions please uh thank you very much uh, uh, dr chandrashekar dev pujari uh, there are two discussions i would request uh, professor wozniak uh, and then after him uh, dr serik to make some comments about today's presentation first professor wozniak <clears throat> professor gotha can you hear me It's okay ah uh, yes thank you very much thank you very much for outstanding pre uh, presentation and uh, uh, brilliant uh, presentation uh, i want to say that my first uh, book uh, which i met in my practice was the hakuba skull base surgery in japanese oh. <laughs> but you are uh, you represent the same school uh, after hata came professor goto and i congratulate you that you pushed forward the development of skull base surgery and uh, by implementation of uh, endoscopic surgery it's a big big step forward and thank you very much for this progress for in skull base surgery uh, concerning your uh, presentation i have some questions first of all i'd like to ask about 
Uh, how do you manage the um, pituitary stock during uh, removal of uh, craniopharyngioma? Do you try to preserve it or you uh, cut it, cut it at, uh, at the beginning of the surgery? This is my first question. Then uh, concerning the CSF leakage uh, after surgery. In your experience in hands, in your clinic, uh, what is the percentage of CSF leaks you have anyway? Anyway, everyone has. What are the percentage of, of this? And the last uh, question concerning uh, embolization of the meningioma before surgery. Do you perform angiography and embolization for all the tumors or you select them uh, somehow? So thank you. Uh, thank you, Hope. Uh, good question. Uh, the first question, uh, in case of the uh, cranial pharyngioma, uh, I uh, always try to preserve the pituitary scope. But right. uh, uh, in some situation, anatomical preservation not lead to the functional preservation. Of course, I try the uh, old anatomical preservation of the pituitary stock, but in some cases, of course, we can prevent, we could prevent the DI or uh, prevent the uh, deficit. But in some cases, after, even after preservation of the stock, uh, we need the replacement. It's one of the very uh, difficult problem in case of the uh, cranial pharyngeal. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is the second question? Yes. Uh, CSF, CSF uh, leakage, okay. CSF leakage. Uh, of, as, uh, you, as you mentioned, prevent the CSF leakage is very, very important. So, as I present, I use a suture technique mm -hmm. and also use a mucosal flap. So uh, the rate of the CSF leakage depends on the pathology. For example, mm -hmm. in case of the pituitary adenoma, the case of CSF leakage is less than 1%. Yeah, I know. In case of the cranial pharyngioma, about 3 or 4%. But in case of the cryo meningioma, our uh, the risk of the CSF leakage is about uh, seven percent. So cryo region and also go to the <clears throat> subdural space, we have to meticulously seal the uh, dural defect, especially large dural defect mm -hmm. around the cryos. It's my uh, comment. Okay. And the thank you. third question is uh, uh, embolization and geography uh, and embolization. Uh, in some cases, of course, I combined the preoperative embolization because uh, in case of the endoscopic approach, coagulation is uh, uh, in some situation very difficult because the such bipolar is a uh, the shape of bipolar is limited. So mm -hmm. if the en uh, embolization is uh, achieved, surgical field always bloodless. So I always ask the, our endovascular team, endovascular embol embolization possible or not? Okay. Thank you, Professor. Good Thank day. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander Wozniak. Your comments are very, always very important uh, for the young neurosurgeon. Uh, Thank you. I request Dr. Serik. Dr. Serik, are you there? You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Serik. Okay. I can't hear you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful lecture by Professor Tako Goto. It is very interesting because uh, we are Scalvis, uh, also Scalvis neurosurgeon. We usually operate it on Scalvis approaches, not endoscopic. I am not familiar with endoscopic, but recently endoscopic uh, approaches developed it, uh, very enormously, uh, contributed so much for the development of uh, Scalvis techniques. So, uh, you have a lot of experience. We have to learn 
a lot of uh, things from endoscopic techniques because endoscopic techniques is more invasive to approach skull-based tumors and uh, protect the normal structure. But you, uh, the CSF leakage and the, maybe the infection is the main complication of uh, endoscopic approach. Uh, so especially for uh, transclival endoscopic approaches, uh, it's sometimes maybe it's very difficult to suture the uh, uh, dura, uh, dural edge of the uh, residual dural edge of the uh, around the tumor. But uh, at this situation, how to make a, a skull based reconstruction to prevent the CSF leakage? Mm. Uh, you also use uh, spinal drainage uh, for uh, such cases. Uh, thank you. Um, when uh, we see the dural defect around clivus, I usually use a relatively large fat graft. I harvest the fat tissue and insert the fat tissue to subdural layer and also put some stitch to fix the fat tissue. And then cover the fibrin glue and also uh, cover the mucosal flap. And in some cases, I use the uh, uh, <clears throat> absorbable plate to sustain the fat tissue. Anyway, in case of the uh, <laughs> multi-layer closure is very important. And then I uh, usually not use a lumbar drain. Thank you, Hope. Uh, question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I can see Bye, many hand raised. Uh, we will go in the order. Uh, ben, you can go first. Please ask your question. Yes. Hello, uh, Professor uh, Koto. Nice to see you again and listen to your lecture. And congratulate on your uh, excellent uh, endoscopic uh, scalpel cases. So I have a question for uh, as concerning the uh, endoscopic approach to cranial pharyngioma. We also have some experience on that. So what is your view towards the during? of the posterior kinoid process and the mobilization of the pituitary gland. Would you uh, do it at the beginning of the, of the uh, surgery? That means extra durally, or would you uh, 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 go into the cavernous um, uh, uh, sinus to, to uh, mobilize the pituitary gland first and then drill the posterior chyloid uh, interdurally. So mm -hmm. uh, what is your uh, view uh, on that? And uh, what is your, would, and would, or would you routinely do this uh, maneuver during your cases uh, for the cranial pharyngioma? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is also a good question. Uh, how to remove the posterior crinoid is depend on the, the size of the posterior crinoid. If the posterior crinoid is not large, we usually we can, uh, we could <coughs> safely resect it out by the epidural procedure. But in case of the large posterior crinoid, the tip of posterior crinoid is completely behind the carotid artery. So in such situation, I roughly drill out the bony structure and then cut to the dura mater along the cellar floor and then mobilize the pituitary gland upward to expose the dorsum cella and also drill out the and expose the paracryval carotid artery to mobilize the carotid artery to lateral side. Mm -hmm. If you mobilize the carotid artery to lateral side and also pituitary gland upward, you can completely expose the, the tip of the large posterior crinoid. And then I reject it out. So it's very controversial. I already mobilized the pituitary gland. So some part is a subdural. 
But the mm. dual procedure is epidural. So no uh, meaning to separate epidural or subdural procedure. But anyway, we have to combine the procedure for safe resection of posterior culinary process. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben. Dr. Mabel, are you there? Yes, please, I'm yes, here. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. Um, one, one thing I learned um, is um, that the keyhole endoscopic approach gives us a panoramic view of these tumors. Um, you gave us quite extensive uh, demonstration of these um, skull-based tumors. They were very illustrative. I realized that you worked on a lot of large tumors. I was wondering, do you have a cutoff size for, especially for the clival tumors? Uh, and then also what directs your choice of cases for the clival meningiomas? Uh, I have a second question. Uh, in your experience, how do you, what are some of the ways that you limit hypothalamic dysfunction with regards to um, craniopharyngioma? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, in case of the, the uh, cryoval tumor or meningioma, uh, when we, I consider the surgical indication, of course, the size of tumor is uh, one of the factor, but the most important factor to decide the approach is the attachment of the tumor or origin of the tumor. If we access the uh, origin or attachment of the tumor through the endoscope, we can uh, reject it out through the endoscopic endonasal or endoscopic keyhole. The size of the tumor is not large, uh, but attachment is wide. It's very difficult to reject through the endoscope. So uh, when, uh, I when I consider the surgical approach, I always uh, evaluate the size of attachment of the tumor and also the origin of the tumor. This is a key point to uh, decide the surgical approach. And second question is, when we uh, reject the craniopharyngioma by the endoscopic endonasal route, always I can confirm the border between tumor and hypothalamus. So the, if the this, uh, we operate the initial case, not recurrent case. The risk of the damage of hypothalamus is very, very low. Uh, I operated, a, uh, already operated a 100, 100 case of craniopharyngioma by the endoscopic endonasal route, but uh, the complication deteriorated the uh, memory or uh, high cognitive function. In all cases, almost all cases preserved, especially new case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Professor. you, Prof. Well, before we go for the uh, next uh, topic, uh, I, I have one question and uh, one sort of information. The question is, uh, uh, maybe Dr. Chandrasekhar Depujari can also contribute to that. It's about those fancotentral meningiomas, which you position the patient in a lateral position, in the park bench position, and you try to go from one side. The craniotomy is on one side, but you put the external ventricular drain on the other side. Now, why do you put it on the other side, Professor? If you, I don't want to question, but my thought is, if we put the external ventricular drain on the same side, we get more relaxed brain, isn't it? Uh, that is the one question. And second is not 
the question is actually information. I'm sure just like me, that there are many young neurosurgeons here, especially we have a young neurosurgeon from Central Asia today who would be uh, seeking to have some sort of a training under you. So do you have any, uh, maybe a fellowship program or any uh, training or a cardiac dissection program? If anything such, please let us know. Prof. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, um, of course, uh, as you say, in some case, uh, we insert the ventricular drainage in the same site. But uh, this case, uh, today I uh, place the patient left side down, park bench or lateral position. So um, I prefer to insert the ventricular drainage from the right side, non-dominant side. So I just insert the ventricle drainage from the right side, okay? And uh, okay. Uh, second question, we have uh, uh, um, in Japan, clinical training is a bit uh, difficult, but uh, we welcome the many young uh, neurosurgeons from the whole country. So we have some cadaveric uh, program and also observe the, our surgery. Always three or a whole uh, guests from whole country visited our institute. Now we have three guests. Usually they join our surgery and observe the, our uh, operation and also join the conference. Our conference is in English, so we discuss the surgical procedure and the concept in English. And also we have some uh, level of the cadaveric study. So uh, the, the, board, the number of the body is limited, but we have, uh, you can learn the anatomy uh, with us. Hmm. This is our uh, program of holding guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Tepizan, you want to say something, sir? I think in falcotentorial meningioma, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Goto already suggested, I think uh, you have to consider in an individual case. One of the important things which we try to carefully see is the displacement of the deep veins because yeah. that can probably give you, apart from the eloquence of the area, that can be one other deciding factor mm. as to which side you will operate from. Uh, in terms of uh, training opportunities, I think uh, we do conduct at least uh, three to four courses per year, uh, including at least three cadaver courses every mm. year for the endoscopic uh, and skull base approaches. And... Uh, uh, fellowships are available on a very, very limited uh, uh, kind of a basis, but uh, they are partly supported by uh, the hospital and partly supported by some other funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll just take one last question and then we'll go for the next session. Otherwise, we'll be short on time. Dr. Uh, Professor Pirzat is there raising the hand. Professor Pirzat, uh, you can make your comment. Uh, I think you can't hear us. So maybe uh, uh, we'll go ahead with our next talk and I would request everyone to be with us uh, because next talk is also equally interesting. I'd request uh, Professor Takio Boto and Dr. Chandrasekhar Dev Pujari to be with us. Uh, the next, uh, uh, I would request Dr. Heba to kindly <laughs> introduce our Dr. next speaker. Uh, Dr. Sachin, excuse me. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Sachin. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Goto, and uh, uh, for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, as you know, uh, we are from Afghanistan and with limited resources. We like uh, your recommendation and advice for uh, limited resources center like Afghanistan uh, without endoscope. Uh, what is your recommendation? and? Uh, 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 advice for uh, how to approach 
with naked eye and uh, without uh, endoscope and microscope. And uh, uh, other uh, uh, Dr. Sachin and uh, uh, Professor Dupo Jerry uh, told us about the training. And uh, uh, we like to also uh, draw your attention for uh, uh, training for Afghan young neurosurgeons as well for uh, scalp based surgery, especially endoscopy and uh, uh, sponsorship some, uh, some programs. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, question. Uh, of course, uh, uh, when uh, you start the uh, scar virus approach. Uh, micro uh, anatomy is a uh, study of micro anatomy uh, of the microscope and endoscope is very, very important. So uh, at first, uh, it's better to start the cat uh, cadaveric study uh, and also to see the surgical technique to abroad. Uh, we also welcome some just observer fellowship, but we cannot perform the financial support. I'm sorry. So, of course, we uh, arrange the guest house, but uh, another fee is not supported in our institute. But anyway, to visit the foreign country and uh, learn the, the concept is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Arigato. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go ahead with our next presentation. Uh, Dr. Heba, I request you to kindly introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sashin. Thanks, uh, Professor Gotu. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker, Asil Ibrahim. She completed her neurosurgical residency in, in the Haitham Hospital, Jordan. And also she had an elective uh, neurosurgical rotation with Professor Majid Sami in the International Neuroscience Institute. She's also a board certificate in Farah Medical Campus. And today she will be discussing with us the management of incidental uh, meningioma. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Asil. Dr. Asil, are you with us? Yes, I'm there. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you, thank you. So much. for always supporting young neurosurgeons. Thank you for the panelists, for the chairpersons. And uh, hello to Professor Dio Pajari, who I, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a couple of times um, last year during uh, international workshops and conferences about neuroendoscopy. Uh, yes, sorry to interrupt. Your voice is not very clearly or Okay. Ms. Butter? It's echoing too much. I think you are in a. Yeah, maybe room. maybe you can tune down. Yeah, now it's the, better. Yeah. yeah. Is this better? Yeah, maybe a little better. Okay. Um, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Kato, for always supporting young neurosurgeons like myself. Thank you for all the chairpersons and panelists here with us today, and a um, uh, special hello to. Professor Dio Pujari, who I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of times during the last uh, year uh, in international, uh, international uh, uh, conferences and workshops uh, uh, about neuroendoscopy. And thank you, Professor Gato, for such a, a great presentation and for, um, for all the anatomy that, that we have seen today. I'll be sharing my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we do. Okay, great. So our topic for today is incidentally diagnosed meningiomas. Um, I usually start my talks with a brief uh, introduction of where I come from. I come from this part of the world, from Jordan and Palestine. Uh, this is where I work. This is Farah Medical Campus in the capital of Jordan, Amman. This is where I work currently at the moment with my father. We have a combined practice between the both of us. 
these are a few pictures of Amman uh, and Jordan, um, where I come from. So this is Amman, the capital of Jordan. This is Jerash. This is the countryside of Jordan. This is the infamous Petra. Here we have the Dead Sea and Wadi Ram. And these are pictures from Palestine. This is Jerusalem. Uh, this is Yaffa and Gaza and Hebron and all other Palestinian cities. And I pray for the peace of, of people in this region. So we will continue with our topic today. And uh, before we talk about incidentally diagnosed meningiomas, we should define what is an incidental finding. And usually it's um, a brain lesion that is found for uh, uh, or during um, investigations for other purposes and for symptoms that are not really uh, uh, related to the finding. And how, how did this happen and why did this start to happen? Because we have higher increased life ex expectancy among people nowadays, so they are, uh, they are more prone to be worked up for various of reasons. We have uh, apparently healthy volunteers admitted into various studies and these volunteers usually get into um, work, uh, work up before they uh, get admitted into these studies and we usually find these uh, findings among these. Uh, we are doing extensive workup for simple complaints and we have better neuroimaging so we are, uh, we are more prone to see uh, these, uh, these findings. And uh, when we talk about incidentally, find, uh, incidentally found lesions, it's not only meningiomas. And throughout my presentation, I will be citing uh, articles about these topics. So the first one I'll be citing is this one from, uh, from Rotterdam, Netherlands, where they have studied 2,000 subjects and uh, to, to see what kind of incidental findings that we see on brain MRI. And they found that the most common uh, lesions are asymptomatic brain infarcts. When it comes to tumors, we usually find meningiomas, but uh, we, we also can find vestibular schwannomas, lipomas, adenomas, and, uh, uh, and other findings. The most common ones were, uh, were aneurysms. And when we see these findings, it's, it's not only the finding that, that we find, and it's, it's also the dilemma of what to do with these findings. Do, do we operate or not? And obviously, for each type of finding, we have a special protocol of how to, to, to deal with these, with these lesions that were incidentally found. But we will be talking about meningiomas. And uh, these are images from this study where they, where they have found atom aneurysms, they have found Chiari, they have found vestibular schwannomas and subdural hematomas, among others. And, um, and they have cited their, uh, their findings. And so the essential point to know when we have uh, an incidental finding for that matter is the clinical significance of the lesion. So is, is, is this lesion causing symptoms? And if the patient has non-specific symptoms, is, it really, uh, is, is this lesion really causing these symptoms? We should consider the natural history of the mentioned lesion. So if it's a, it's a, it's a, if it's a fast growing lesion, if it's, if it's life threatening when it, when it, when it, when it, uh, when it complicates, should we operate or not? And we should clearly know the indications for the intervention of these lesions. So let's move on to incidentally diagnosed meningiomas. And as I said, I will be uh, quoting and citing uh, various articles about this. The first one is this beautiful one by Professor Nakamura, Roser, Professor uh, Sami, where they studied the natural history of incidental meningiomas in 41 patients. And the conclusion here was the majority of incidentally found meningiomas, they show minimal growth, if any, and they can be observed without surgical interventions. And uh, among these papers that I, that I will be talking about, they have studied and they tried to to know what are the predictive factors for growth and for intervention when it comes to uh, meningiomas. So this study showed that tumor growth is associated with patient's age. So the higher and the older the patient, the more prone they are to have their meningioma grow, uh, the, uh, to, to, to have it not grow. And the initial tumor size, they found that it was, it was not considered uh, a predictive factor. And the most important predictive factor when it comes to these patients is the 
absence or presence of calcification. So if there's calcification, it's less prone to grow. And if it has a hyper intense signal on T2 MRI, it's more prone to grow. And this study showed the, that the, the most common symptoms that these patients came with were headache and dizziness among others. And these are non-specific uh, symptoms that we, we, we can't really say that this lesion is causing these symptoms per se. And uh, they also studied the location of these uh, of these lesions. So most of them were convexity meningiomas, cavernous sinus, phenoid wing, uh, CP angle, among others. And they studied the annual growth rate, the relative growth rate, and the tumor doubling time. And here I should mention that there were uh, multiple ways of uh, knowing the um, growth rate. So some studies have uh, measured the increase in diameter when it comes uh, to the to the tumor size, and some studies uh, opted to do volumetric assessment. So with this, we can find that. Uh, that the younger the patient, the more they are prone to have annual growth rates. So here we have the mean age of 54, 54, 55. And here we can see that they are more prone to have growth in their lesions. And this, uh, these findings were clinically significant according to the, to the p-value. Uh, again, here with the, uh, with the time. So uh, uh, here we can see that it goes along with the, uh, with the, with the aforementioned findings. Uh, the absolute annual growth uh, rate uh, with, when it comes to, to, to calcification, we can see here that the absence of calcification correlates with, uh, uh, with more growth when it comes to these uh, lesions and hyperintensity correlates with uh, more growth. And they also studied uh, other uh, other papers that have that have discussed this topic, and they have uh, mentioned uh, whether whether or not they think these factors are important. So when it comes to the gender of the patient, only one study found that it was significant. When it comes to age, two studies found that the age had a had a significant impact on that. Initial tumor size the same. Follow up time it, it's varied from one study to the other, but classification and T2 signal were the more were the most consistent ones. The next study I will be talking about is the uh, is this one from Cleveland, Ohio, and it also talked about the natural history of intracranial meningiomas. And this study was consistent with the previous study when it mentioned that patients younger than 60 years and who had hyperintensity on T2 and no classification had more growth. And um, uh, this one had, uh, they were measuring the growth using the diameter. So 25 millimeter was the cutoff point for them uh, uh, that, that showed growth. Um, and here they also mentioned the, the location of the, um, um, of the legions. And I should mention that all of these studies were retrospective studies. So they, they, they studied, patients that were uh, incidentally uh, found to have meningiomas and they followed their follow-up and their um, um, and their management. And a lot, of, a lot of the studies that I have read about this topic showed that the location per se didn't predict uh, the, the growth of the, uh, of the lesion, but a lot of, uh, a lot of the times uh, it's dictated when to, to intervene and we will talk about this um, um, in, a, in a bit. So uh, again, these findings are consistent with uh, with other findings that have that have been mentioned during um, oh, for for this for this study. Uh, here we can see that uh, most of these lesions were incidentally diagnosed that, that the patient didn't have symptoms, and we can see that here that no classification showed more uh, were less, so they should more growth, and it goes with the natural history that most meningiomas don't grow, most incidental meningiomas don't grow, and he, uh, this is the ISO or low uh, intensity and the peritumeral edema. Some studies found that it was significant and predicted the growth of, uh, of the meningioma, and others found that it was not. For this study, the um, clinical significance uh, the, the factors that showed clinical significance when, when studies were the age, were the, uh, were the calcification, absence, or the presence of 
uh, of calcification, the ISO and high T2 signal, and the presence of edema. Another study from Japan also showed that majority of these uh, of these tumors don't uh, don't exhibit tumor growth along with the with the with the with the follow-up period. And again, the follow-up period varied from one study to the to the other. The least um, the least duration was 12 months, and the maximum was, uh, I believe, two, two, uh, 200 months. And uh, this study uh, showed uh, the 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 patients when they had to intervene, and the uh, and and the follow up uh, period for these for these patients were as such. And these patients in yellow, they they had to intervene because they had symptoms, and we can see that the that the symptoms varied from cerebral signs to seizures to ophthalmoplegia and and, um, and hemiplegia and uh, basically as we as we always say that uh, medicine and surgery has become a, um, a custom made uh, uh, a, a approach to the patient so we can't really generalize um, a specific uh, way how to deal with any lesion. So we should take into consideration the patient, the patient's age and medical condition and the symptoms they come with before we decide to operate or not. Uh, this is another one from Utah and also uh, shows that most incidental meningiomas uh, and asymptomatic can be observed using serial imaging, and that uh, intervention, whether it's surgical or with gamma knife, is reserved for, uh, for symptomatic lesions or patients uh, or lesions that show growth. It also uh, quoted and cited other, other studies, and basically uh, most, most studies have come to the same conclusion when it comes to, the, to classification and age. And uh, this one uh, had, I had mentioned the differential diagnosis for meningiomas, and we should keep in mind that our our diagnosis of meningioma, quote unquote, it's um, radiological diagnosis, and we don't have a, histop a histopathological confirmation on this diagnosis. So when we find an incidental lesion that is radiologically consistent with meningioma, we should follow it follow it up closely at the beginning because it can very much not be a meningioma, it can be one of these lesions, and it's it's a it's a, it's a whole other ball game when we when we when we deal with these with, with these lesions. So it's it's vitally important to follow up these uh, patients closely at the beginning with serial imaging at three months, six months, nine months, uh, and to document uh, that there is no growth at the appearance of these lesions is still consistent with a meningioma that is benign. And we can we can actually follow it up with serial uh, with serial imaging because these these lesions the management of, of them is uh, is vastly different. And we have this one uh, that have uh, studied uh, the 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 natural history of meningioma and have done serial volumetric assessment not only the diameter uh, measurement and uh, this one also uh, mentioned that. The growth of meningioma is not necessarily um, linear, that we have linear uh, growth, that we have exponential growth, and that the same lesion can exhibit uh, both, kinds, uh, both kinds of growth. So the lesion may start with an exponential growth and then continue with linear uh, growth when it reaches a certain uh, size. Um, and they have talked about these, um, these uh, lesions right here. And again, the um, um, statistically significant uh, factors were classification. And this one mentioned brain tumor border. And um, it, it wasn't um, significant, but it is, uh, it is, to, it is something to, to, to keep in mind when um, dealing with these, with these patients. And they have plotted this graph when it comes to tumor, uh, tumor volume. So as we said, it starts in, 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 an, in an exponential matter. And when it reaches a certain uh, size, it, it uh, continues in a linear-like uh, uh, manner, and then it reaches a plateau. And this is why we can follow up um, a meningioma that was incidentally found, because we assume that it has reached its plateau, or it's, it's in, the, in the last phase of its linear-like um, growth. And um, uh, this um, paper uh, has given us um, 
sort of an approach how to deal with these with these lesions. So if, if the patient is less than 65 uh, years of age and they have an, um, an asymptomatic lesion, we can follow it uh, up with a close uh, follow up. And, uh, and, we, and, we, and we should consider um, a stereotactic radio surgery for the, for the regions that are in, uh, an, in an important neurovascular location like a cavernous sinus um, uh, location. If they are symptomatic, obviously the primary treatment is surgery and we should take into consideration the patient's medical condition and if they and, uh, and whether or not they will need um, an adjuvant radiotherapy uh, afterwards. If the patient is older than 65, and uh, and or they are post surgical candidate again. If they are asymptomatic, we can follow up. If they are symptomatic, we can go for for stereotactic radio surgery. If they are not a good surgical candidate, um, uh, and uh, surgery is always considered if the patient is developing symptoms that are resistant to all kinds of um, measures, even if if it has a high uh, mortality or morbidity, but of course, uh, after uh, making an informed consent with the with the patient. So uh, take home messages when it comes to this topic, that majority of asymptomatic uh, incidentally diagnosed meningiomas don't grow in size. Uh, when it comes to uh, to the growth, uh, the, the most agreed upon and the most uh, precise one is the volumetric assessment. It does take longer to do because you have to uh, to manually trace uh, the the tumor on the on the MRI, but it's more precise and you can actually uh, uh, you can actually have a better judgment of the um, of the growth. And they and some studies have uh, decided that the cutoff value is fifteen percent increase in size. Uh, that that this number is the one. Clinically significant, uh, and it, that, that it shows that the tumor has actually grown, and anything less than fifteen percent could be um, an, an error from person to person. Uh, we should also know that the predictive factors of growth is age less than sixty years. I'm sorry, this is a typo. Age less than sixty years, hyperintensity on T2, absence of calcification, and plus minus premature edema. Factors that are still under debate and will need more uh, more research is gender, if it plays a role when it comes to, to this. Initial tumor size upon diagnosis, because as we said, the uh, tumor uh, growth pattern uh, could uh, could lead us and could uh, make us make an assumption if this tumor is uh, has reached its um, plateau phase or not. Tumor location, as, as we have said, if it's, if it's close to an important uh, neurovascular um, structures, we should keep in mind that uh, we have a lower threshold for um, for surgery because otherwise it would be a complicated surgery with a higher mortality and morbidity rate. Um, some studies have quoted that um, histo histopathological subtype can correlate with um, uh, with the with the outcome of, of the of, or the possibility of the tumor growth or not, but this still needs more uh, more research, as as we have said that most of these studies were retrospective studies. Um, observation should be at close intervals at start, because as we have said, we it's a, it's a radiological diagnosis, it's not a histopathological uh, confirmed uh, diagnosis, so we should keep in mind that this can be something else. Um, and uh, if, if we have um, symptoms, if we have um, a, a clinically significant increase in size, we should opt for surgery. Um, and points to consider when opting for conservative approaches, as we have said, the proximity to important neurovascular structures, the complexity of surgery, if and when it becomes necessary, and patients' overall medical condition. And the treatment options is obviously surgery when, it, when, when we need to treat is surgery versus uh, gamma knife, but surgery is obviously the first line uh, option in, in, in symptomatic patients. And with this, I end and thank you for the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asil, for giving us a good uh, overview of uh, a symptomatic incidentally found uh, meningiomas. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Depujari sir to please make some comment and tell us about his experience about how to manage uh, this type of uh, meningiomas. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Asil. That was a good extensive review. Uh, two points which I am a little confused about is the age. Uh, did you try to tell us that there is a higher rate of growth above the age of 60? Or did I understand? No, no, less, less, less than 60. It was, it was a typo. It was, it was, right. um, so yeah, I think uh, that was one thing which in your take-home message, you probably need to make a small change. And secondly, most of us believe that skull-based meningiomas probably glow slower than the convexity meningiomas, but that has not been borne out by any of your uh, statistical charts so far. Uh, is that correct? Um, the the papers that I that I have done have read uh, didn't really uh, discuss the um, importance of location when it comes to growth, uh, because basically they, they didn't find that skull-based tumor uh, uh, grow more or slower or faster than convexity ones. Maybe I should have done more um, um, uh, reading about this. But uh, so far, the, the location-wise wasn't statistically significant to actually include as, uh, as, a, as an obvious Factor, but they 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 did mention that a skull based meningioma uh, does have a lower threshold for surgery because it will be a more complex surgery to do if it if it does grow in size. Okay. Uh, the only other thing I would like to say before I uh, you know pass on to, uh, the comments to others is that. Uh, you you mentioned something which is probably a little out of this uh, paper is uh, the choice of treatment uh, when you see some kind of a growth or when you decide to treat these patients. And you said surgery is the first option. I think that depends on one is, of course, the location and the possible risks. And I think if you have a petroclaval meningioma, which is very small and which has shown some slight growth, many people would be justified in treating them with, uh, you know, SRS uh, of some kind. So you have anything to say on that? Or maybe I would ask other faculty to uh, give their comments. Yes, sir. I have, I have mentioned when the, when the um, um, with the table that the location was the first option. Uh, but the tumor is less than... Um, Three centimeters in size, according to that paper, yes. they can they can treat it uh, with uh, stereotactic uh, surgery. And if it's if it's more and and and, and if it's symptomatic and causing symptoms uh, that that need to be addressed with surgery, that that we should go for surgery. But uh, of course, if it's if it's small in size in a deep seated location, surgery will not be our first line uh, option. Thank you. Sachin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, um, uh, may I request Professor Takio Goto to give us uh, his uh, uh, view about how uh, you manage exactly how meningiomas, the smaller meningiomas, especially in Japan. Uh, what is your comment from this? Uh, thank you. Uh, in case of the asymptomatic uh, meningioma, of course, in Japan, weight and scan is a gold standard. But uh, as uh, Dr. Asil uh, Shabi uh, nicely reviews the papers, uh, of course, uh, how to treat should be decided depend on the location and also the age of patient. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, long time tumor control over 20 year or 80 year is uh, very, very difficult. So if we found that the small tumor in case of young patient, we have to closely observe the patient. And if the size of tumor increase, we decide the uh, resection of the tumor to cure the disease in some location. It's my comment. Of course, uh, uh, weight and scan is gold standard in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Takeboto. Uh, Professor Alexander, your comments, please. 
Dear Dr. Zbeik, thank you very much. Thank you for very uh, precious, very <clears throat> good observation of the literature. Uh, I would like to, mm, to speak about my some of my practical uh, tricks I use in my practice. So when I meet uh, uh, the patient with incidental meningioma at the first appointment, uh, I evaluate the first the age and sex the, that the first uh, that the first uh, markers I, I analyze, and then uh, I decide how long the period observation will be for the for this patient. Shorter or longer depends on for, for potential threat for the uh, for the patient. Uh, for in my practice, uh, the in the, the peritumoral edema is very important. The increasing of edema on the without even increasing of uh, tumor volume, if uh, I think I see that uh, edema uh, of the brain surrounding brain gets larger, I think about surgery even if uh, tumor is not symptomatic. And. Uh, mm, to conclude your lecture, I'd like to emphasize that the observation is also a treatment treatment option for the patient in this, in, in many cases, especially in patients with incidence meningioma. So it's safe, you don't operate, uh, and patient don't, doesn't get worse during the observation. From the other hand, we <clears throat> must evaluate the uh, psychological condition of the patient. Sometimes the small meningioma is a big, uh, big psychological problem for the patient. And patients insist on surgery by itself because it cannot live, cannot live uh, in, their, uh, in their everyday life. So in these cases, we must operate because the patient insists on this surgery and we must resolve this psychological pr problem of, of the patient. This is my mention. And General, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gato, for your comments. Um, yes, I don't think it comes to the significant uh, factor that it has been mentioned in these, in these, uh, in these papers. And um, patient education and uh, reassurance is, um, is, uh, is vital when it comes to this. So, so they so they would uh, agree with the with the observation period, and they would agree for the follow appointment, and they can be properly managed afterwards. Okay, thank you. And the last one, what, what I want to say that I want to warn everybody uh, to use uh, the such a kind of preventive radio surgery. I never do it in my in my practice, and do not recommend to doing it. And because irradiated meningioma meningioma can be a double problem for the patient and for you also in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Doctor Alexander Wojtniak. I agree with that last point, which is very important you made. Uh, Doctor Dragon had a hand raised, and then he's got his hand down. You want to ask anything, Doctor Dragon? Yes, yes, thank you very much uh, for the great lecture. I just have a question regarding to the outcome uh, and the follow-up. Uh, what is the most effective uh, follow-up protocol? Uh, three, three months in the first year, then uh, six months, or uh, what your opinion and your recommendation? Uh, Dr. Asil? Yes, um, so, yeah. so basically at the start, as, as, we, ha as we have said, it should be on, um, on close follow-up so we can rule out any other uh, meningioma mimics. So it's three months, six months, nine months. And then according to the to the growth and to the symptoms, we can do an annual one. Uh, this is, uh, this is what, what, what we do in, in my practice. I don't know if, if anyone else has um, has any other opinions, but uh, basically this is this is what we do. Thank you, thank you very much, Doctor Asil. Uh, yes, Doctor Ben, I'll come to you. Just before that, Doctor Serik, are you there? If you can make some comment about uh, your experience about incidentally found small asymptomatic meningioma, how to manage any specific point you want to add on. Um, 
thank you. Thank you so much uh, for Dr. Azel, uh, detailed reviewing the medical literature about incidental finding meningiomas, even in incidental finding meningiomas, maybe some patients have some psychological problems, maybe some symptoms after you detailed analysis of the patient. So we also recommend the patient uh, have a serial imaging, wait and see uh, method. Uh, mainly observation at the beginning, but uh, if the patient has uh, symptoms or maybe growth in thighs, uh, we also uh, recommend the surgery. I personally not recommend the stereotaxis or uh, gamma knife for uh, asymptomatic uh, meningiomas uh, because in our experience, we don't have a publication on this. Uh, gamma knife, but uh, we have some experience with small meningiomas uh, with gamma knife, but uh, during the observation period, we did not find any changes uh, in size. So we did not recommend uh, for small meningiomas uh, for gamma knife or stereotactic surgery, just uh, follow up. But some locations, I think that uh, some locations, some hypervascular areas like uh, skull base, uh, maybe petroclival areas. Some tumors is uh, in significant size, not less than three centimeter, but in significant size, it's all, always interactive with the brain stem, but no sim symptoms. But in the young patients, we recommend, uh, sometimes we recommend surgery because if the tumors became bigger, the complication and the operative uh, complication will be increased. So in some selected cases, according to your, your surgical experience, maybe re you recommend the surgery for maybe intermediate sized uh, tumors. So another problem is uh, the predicting factors uh, because uh, in detailed analysis of medical literature, there's no literature about, about the vasculation of the meningiomas. So it's also important. In our experience, some uh, intermediate-sized meningiomas, maybe larger meningiomas without any neurological symptoms, we also recommend angiography uh, to check up the vasculature. If the tumor is uh, classified and the no uh, significant vascular uh, supply, we recommend the observation. Uh, so maybe angiographic uh, diagnostics is also important for maybe some selected cases we recommend because in our everyday practice, we do angiography for all of our meningi meningioma cases. So uh, it's maybe uh, some predicting points may be found and that you can predict the uh, likelihood of uh, growth in future. So yes, I think that uh, the uh, size, location and the age uh, except the uh, classification and the surrounding brain edema uh, is important. Uh, uh, of course, if the tumor is uh, not big in old patient, more than 65 years old, uh, the recommendation is uh, observation. No gamma knife, no uh, surgery. So that's our uh, standard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do agree with the with the point about the, the gamma knife, uh, also in my practice, we don't usually go for gamma knife uh, as, a, as a preemptive strike or as a preventive um, measure because we, we, we do keep in mind that the possibility of this tumor growing, that it may need post-surgery gamma knife. So if we, so, so, so if we give gamma knife at first, we, we strip the patient of that, of that um, possibility of having adjuvant uh, um, um, gamma knife after surgery. And uh, as I have said, um, things have become uh, more custom made towards the, the patient. So we can't really take a one, uh, one kind of approach to, to everyone. Uh, we should decide on patient, uh, patient by patient uh, basis. We take into consideration the, patient, the patient's age, the overall medical condition, their psychiatric uh, condition when, when they get the diagnosis of having a mass lesion in their, in their head. Most people don't like this. They, they don't like the fact that they are walking around with a, with a tumor in their head. 
and uh, so 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 each each of each of um, of these uh, factors are um, considered and talked about with each patient, and it's a, it's a it's a combined uh, decision when it comes to the approach. So the doctor and the patient, uh, we, we talk with, with our patients and we, we make a combined decision on the on the approach when it comes to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Skerik. Uh, you can see Dr. Akit Shukwa Anyaku, you had a hand raised. Kindly introduce yourself, doctor, and then ask your question. You are muted, doctor. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sachin. My name is Ike Chuku Aniako. I, I am a post-fellowship senior registrar at the University of Nigerian Teaching Hospital in Nugu, Nigeria. Uh, thank you, Professor Yoko Katu, for your efforts in neurosurgical education and care all over the globe. I appreciate all the panelists. Thank you, the presenter, Dr. Sachin, for that work on uh, incidental meningiomas. Uh, the, the decision to manage incidentally diagnosed meningiomas is really a very difficult one. As in, some patients can live the entire lifespan with an incidentally diagnosed meningioma. Well, we agree that some may develop symptoms in the course of time. Yeah, I am of the opinion that we should closely follow up these patients. And yeah, we, we, there are some telltale signs of uh, growth, as you said, or management, where you have patients above eight, 60 years, uh, T2 hyperintensity, and um, fluorid, peri, tumoral edema, and others. Well, I think observation should be very paramount, should be very important in the management of these patients. Thank you so much. Because of the cost, sorry, because of the, if the complications of surgery, and then the patient can live this entire lifespan with this uh, meningioma. So on that note, I will say thank you so much for this presentation, and thank you all the panelists for all your contributions. Thank you once more. Thank you for your comment, Doctor. Thank you. And uh, it was a very interesting. Uh, it's, it's certainly very interesting to to see these uh, these regions, and they do give um, a dilemma of what to to deal with them. Uh, but as we as we as we move on, and as we read more, and as we encounter more patients, and we attend these meetings, we learn from the best, and we get to to listen to how how how, how everyone deals. With these with these lesions in their in their institutes, and uh, we can we can have a more informed uh, way of, of of dealing with things. So thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Doctor Hill. Uh, we'll take one last question before we close. Doctor Ben, please go ahead. Uh, hello, Doctor Ashu. Uh, nice to hear you. Uh, uh, nice to listen to your presentation again. Another. Uh, very comprehensive review for the small asymptomatic meningioma. My question uh, is that uh, for those uh, small asymptomatic meningioma that enlarge during a pregnancy, uh, would you uh, consider um, uh, excision for those uh, um, meningioma or, or in your literature review, what, are the, uh, what, what is the behavior of this type of uh, meningioma? Would they continue to enlarge uh, after the pregnancy, or do they regress? Or, um, but uh, I, I think some of the some of surgeon would uh, consider excision for this enlarging meningioma after the pregnancy uh, is completed if there is no neurological deterioration. So, uh, but my question is that uh, what is the behavior of this type of small uh, asymptomatic meningioma that enlarge during the pregnancy and uh, is, uh, what is the uh, management uh, strategy that is best uh, for this type of uh, patients? Maybe uh, maybe I would like to ask Dr. Ashu and also the panelists, what's your view on this? 
Yeah, um, thank you for your for your comment and for the question. Uh, basically, I haven't read anything about uh, about the about the behavior of incidentally uh, diagnosed meningiomas during pregnancy. But I believe uh, they uh, we should we should we should do more um, research about this. Uh, so I'm not sure if it if it if it displays any kind of different behavior than. Um, Symptomatic meningiomas. So I would I would leave this question to the to the panelists and to the chairpersons. Uh, Dr. Ben, maybe you want to repeat your question for the chairperson once again. No, I'm just asking uh, maybe if there is uh, any uh, any um, uh, colleagues uh, from other parts of the world that, uh, you, that you encounter small asymptomatic meningioma that enlarge during the pregnancy. So what is the, what is the approach to this type yeah, of the patients? Or, or is there, what is the behavior of this type of uh, meningioma? Would they, would they um, remain static or regress after the pregnancy or, or, or the other way around? Yeah. Uh Maybe uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Dev Pujari, you would like to ask that question because there are many uh, estrogen receptors that have also been uh, discussed and uh, published about meningiomas. So, Dr. Chandrasekhar Dev Pujari, a meningioma, small meningioma, but which is suddenly growing up mm -hmm. during the uh, pregnancy, how to uh, manage this kind of tumors? So I think uh, rapid growth during pregnancy is known and we have actually operated on two patients during pregnancy. But in most cases, if they are not uh, very symptomatic with raised intracranial pressure, we would wait till the child is delivered and operate uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, in terms of using these drugs uh, to retard the growth of the tumor, I think there have been several attempts, uh, but uh, none of them have shown too much uh, uh, promise. Oh, baby, what about the cyber knife or SRS? Uh, how safe and effective is during pregnancy? Uh, no, I have personally not used cyber knife for the only indication to operate uh, during pregnancy is if the patient has raised intracranial pressure. And in that uh, kind of a symptomatology, you do not recommend SRS to these patients because most of them are large and uh, you want immediate kind of relief. Yes. But may, I, may, I, may I add something? Um, if, it's, if it's causing symptoms, then it's not incidentally diagnosed meningiomas. And I'm not sure if we would get a pregnant lady uh, to, the, to the MRI if she doesn't have significant symptoms. So I, uh, I personally wouldn't, wouldn't work up a pregnant lady who has no specific symptoms like headache or dizziness, unless she has like a frank, uh, important symptom that can be that that that, that I should work up using uh, a brain a brain MRI, even though even though it's safe, but we don't really have um, um, evidence uh, class one evidence on that, so I wouldn't risk a pregnant patient going into the MRI for an unspecific symptom. So I'm not sure. If there is anything in the literature about uh, incidentally diagnosed meningiomas in pregnant ladies per se, and 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 how to follow up with that, so uh, I'm I'm not sure. Well, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other question or uh, from the panelists or from the discussion or from the attendees? Anybody want to raise the hand before we close? Okay, then uh, it's a time to close. I would request Professor Yokogato to uh, say a few uh, uh, comments about, before we close about today's session. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Delphine, that, that you made so many the good uh, comments, and also the uh, Professor Alexander uh, as well, and also the Dr. Tarek from uh, Kazakhstan. So as a YNS webinar, uh, maybe we will more the YNS from uh, Central Asia or Africa or maybe the South, uh, South America uh, in the future. 
And also for the YNS, I think uh, I know the Professor Goto since he was young. <laughs> so he studied, of course, uh, the anatomy and also the, the very large the skull base, uh, the, the surgery with Professor Hakuba. And he switched to the, the minimally invasive. I think it's a time for the minimally invasive for the both, not only the patient, but also the, the doctors. So in Japan, we have us the working hour will be limiting uh, in next year. Uh, it is uh, uh, obligatory. So uh, we must change our uh, the, the how to treat the, uh, the patients and give them some of the, uh, the best results. And also, uh, I think uh, for wireless, I think uh, you better to, uh, to write a paper, please. So uh, Dr. Ashil, uh, wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. So I think uh, you uh, made a great uh, the summary of the uh, incidental meningioma and the including of the uh, maybe bi biological behavior. So I, I think uh, you please submit your paper to any the journal, I think. And also uh, for wireless, I think uh, that you'd better to uh, see the, uh, the surgery as many as possible. Of course, you can visit some institute or of course you can see the video. And uh, uh, I think uh, a very fundamental thing is uh, 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 anatomy, Takeo uh, Goto, that he mentioned. I think it's very important. So if the, you know the anatomy, so your, your surgery, can be very fast, I think. So, uh, from this from this year, the, our ICNS Wines webinar, now we can extend more uh, remote place. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful uh, uh, webinar. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you. Thank you. And any comments from the chairperson or the discussion before I make the final announcement of the next webinar, uh, Dr. Dev Pujari. No, thank you for uh, a great webinar. Uh, I'm really sorry that Asil could not uh, present uh, with her own presence and a uh, few glitches about the audio, but uh, it was a well-researched paper and I hope all the very, uh, I wish all the very best for the future uh, uh, webinars of uh, the ACNS uh, uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, just thank you. Uh, I just want to comment about the about the audio and the and the uh, and the video. I am I'm, I'm actually at the moment I'm I'm in London. I'm not in Jordan, and um, uh, I'm using my sister's laptop. So there's uh, there's been some technical issues with that. So I apologize for this, but um, thank you. Professor Kato again for always giving us uh, the support and thank you, Professor for, for all, all of your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. So I have few announcements to make. Uh, first of all, today, uh, maybe after uh, uh, one hour, we will have uh, ACNN, that is Asian Congress of Neuroners uh, webinar, wherein uh, Dr. Uh, Ashish Kumar, uh, along with the two neuro nurses from India, Dr. Shanti uh, Shiny from uh, Sri Chitra Institute and Dr. Suchitra. The topic is subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I'd request all of you to share this information with uh, all your nurses so that they can attend this uh, webinar and uh, benefit out of it. Our next two webinar is, uh, next one is on 29th of January. Uh, which is also about the endoscopic ski hole approaches, wherein Professor Tadashi Watanabe will present about endoscopic uh, ski hole approaches, uh, current status. And uh, Dr. Uh, Ravi Kiran Yutha from Mumbai will present about Atlanto axial instability and chair formation, his philosophy. The next one will be on the 12th of February, wherein uh, uh, Professor Andre Lotein is going to present on how to choose the best approach for anterior for some angiomas. And uh, Dr. Nicolo Manchesni from Italy is going to present about spinal trauma management, especially in low and middle income countries. There are two webinars for the young neurosurgeon. The first one is on 3rd to 5th March. This is a hybrid uh, workshop. Uh, the theme is uh, vascular, that is both endovascular and microvascular neurosurgery. So for this, we are planning to have one YNS session. 
So if anybody is interested to travel uh, to Bangladesh, on 5th of March, we'll have a young neurosurgeon session wherein they can present uh, 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 their presentation. Uh, we will try to make their accommodation and registration free. So this is the one. And next one is our second World Young Neurosurgeon Congress, which will be uh, uh, from 29 July to 1st August in Indonesia, which is full of many workshops, cadaver workshops on the spine, on the functional neurosurgery, glioma surgery, endovascular, microvascular anastomosis, trauma, and about the, uh, my, uh, about the anatomy. So for all those people who are wanting to have a good uh, 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 training of cadaver dissection and learning anatomy, you can uh, uh, count on this uh, uh, conference. Uh, there is a small uh, uh, promotion video of the conference. Okay. Is audible? I think it's not audible. Just give me one minute. Yeah. It's audible now. Yes, it's audible. Congress, Second World Wireless Congress, will have a award a young neurosurgeon session. So please try to send your abstract. Uh, for initial few uh, young neurosurgeons, we'll try to take care of the hospitality. So the link is there on uh, my Facebook page. Uh, so you can visit my Facebook page and get the link from there. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can conclude the webinar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the next. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. much.